once again, that's for so, um, Lord, we ask you to bless this offering as we can. Bless those that are in need. We just thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we're going to begin the message tonight, um, if I could just maybe see if everyone can move up just a little. I'm starting to have a lot of green, orange, and blue, and uh, yellow. Yeah. The, uh, the message that God has placed um, on our hearts tonight. Um, we have been in the middle of Some revelations that the Lord has been giving uh, my wife and I. And, um, it kind of started several weeks back when uh, when someone had called us and had um, said they felt like the Lord had laid on their heart to support the ministry. Uh, they had been supporting it kind of on a monthly basis. But um, not uh, not as much as they had were going to be pledging. And repeatedly, three times in the conversation, they said, "The Lord wants us to reverse what we're doing. Um, we're giving this. The Lord wants us to do this. We're reversing it." And they said it three times. And Sandy came up to me and said. Um, you know, there's something significant. Is that right? Um, she said that uh, this is significant. And so I was like, okay, you know, let's just keep it in prayer. I didn't quite put any more weight on it necessarily than that. I, I felt like the Lord was in the process of reversing some things. And then earlier this week, now, you have to understand, my wife and I have been through a season where we love Jesus, and we love the prophetic words that, uh, that are given, but we had told each other we're not going to read any more prophetic words. You know, we have the Elijah list, we're subscribed to it, we're not reading any more. Um, and it was not a bitter thing, it was just like, all right, Lord, I, I want to just see you. I don't want to just hear about the stuff that's coming, I want to see something happen. And so I'm on my way to work, I think it was last Monday, or last Tuesday. And I get a text from Sandy saying, you need to read this. And it had the, the link. So the uh, obedient man of God that I am, I clicked on the link and started reading it. I'm through it as I'm driving. Um, I don't encourage that. <laughs> New York State Police, if you're watching this, I won't encourage I was reading it and just kind of glancing through it. And as I glanced through it, I started crying. And that's probably one of the worst things that happened because I'm driving and you know, kind of glancing back and forth, and I started crying, and I, my, the hair on my arms was standing up, and I was like, what is going on? And I started reading this, this word that was given, and the Lord was like, this is you right now, and this is what I'm doing. And I was like, oh my gosh. Um, I was just blown away, because it was literally a word that was so directed at my spirit that I was like, oh my gosh. And at first, like I said, at first I was like, well, why is Sandy giving this to me? Like, we don't, we're not looking through these anymore. So tonight we're going to kind of do a joint message based on what we feel like the Lord has been giving us. Um, so I'm going to read the word that was given. Some of you have heard it, some of you read it, some of you haven't. But I'm going to read the word because it's critical to where we feel like the Lord has us and the word that God gave us that we're going to share tonight. And um, we both feel very strongly that this is the word of the Lord. 
Um, the word is from a woman out of Australia. And I'm going to give you a little background right now. A woman out of Australia named Lana Bosser. And she had started uh, she had started a petition, which I heard someone say the other night that she has what 1.2, was it Jessica or someone saying that she had one point, she started, she started the 30th, two days ago, a prayer for the United States in Australia. And we're going to read that in just a minute, but she wanted a week of prayer for the United States. She has she had just randomly 1.2 million hits for that prayer and intercession for the United States. And if that's all the people that pray, that's 1.2 million people. That's a pretty decent sizable chunk of people. But you can imagine the amount of churches and people that are seeing this. God is stirring something huge. And um, so this is what the word says. I have the words on my heart all morning. This is a crossover week. I had an excitement in my spirit thinking about this week. The atmosphere has felt pregnant all morning. So I went before the Lord about what I was hearing. I saw the enemy, and he was working so hard, attempting. What is wrong? Hold on a second. My phone is shut. Okay. He was attempting to build fortresses around the people of God to keep them stayed. Stay means in place. I saw him building furiously and looking around anxiously because he saw what was coming. He was using circumstances around the people of God to build them in fortresses. Many, and this is when I started to cry, because many had felt boxed in. And intense amounts of stress and pressure the last few months as the boxing in has seen you intensify. Friends, the enemy is scared of what you're about to step into. He is working furiously to build fortresses around the people of God to keep them hidden, caged, and unable to move forward. As the boxing in pressure feeling was intensifying, I saw the people of God continuing to stand despite the hardship. In the midst of all the pressure, I saw Jesus standing with the people of God, and he was placing his hand on them, and fire was being released from his hand. Even in the boxing in that the enemy was attempting, the Lord was using it to purify his people. Sound familiar? Heal his people. Strengthen his people. And they were shining like gold the more and more fire was placed upon their lives. We read this last week in our sermon. But in the fire they were not burnt. While they looked at him, and not at the fire or at the fortress the enemy was attempting to build, they were being filled with joy and peace and a strength to stand like I had never seen. A strength anchored in Jesus that they would not be shaken. And then we get crossover. I then saw Jesus place his hand on the hearts of his people, and one by one he smiled and said, It's time to cross over. As they took his hand and started to walk towards the wall of the fortress the enemy was building, it began to shake violently, and it crumbled and fell on top of him, as in the devil fell back on top of him. I then saw the Lord speak. The enemy's plans are being foiled as you hold my hand. This week will be a week of divine reversal. Remember the word that this person had spoken three times, three weeks prior. This will be a week of divine reversal as you hold my hand, my beautiful people. Hold my hand. You are crossing over the fortress the enemy has attempted to build. A shift is taking place where you are moving into the land of repayment. Things are going to suddenly reverse this week as the people of God press in and reaffirm their trust in me. I then saw a credit card machine where you place your credit card in to pay for something and on the screen was the display processing. And that word seemed to stay there for what seemed like forever. Then suddenly it changed to the words approved when funds have been cleared. I felt the Lord saying that this, is, this week is going to signal moving from the process of processing to approved. Fulfillment, divine shifts, what may have been sown in faith according to his word, the heavenly withdrawal will take place this week for men. And then saw the Lord say, this week again, I will show my people approved. 
I sense this is a huge week for pressing in for any areas of identity and belief systems and hearts where your heart has believed lies and not seen yourself as he does. Press in this week for the encounters await this week, specifically targeting the area of healing identity. He's going to show you again how approved of you are by him. He is recalibrating hearts this week to see the truth of who they are and what he thinks of them. And it talked about um, increase of favor, huge amounts of favor, people being awestruck by the Lord and the kisses of God. And then she went on to say that there are many of you who have felt like you were supposed to write and you stopped writing, that the Lord wants you to write again. The word approval, though, there was so critical as I, as I was glancing through this because last year, Sandy and I were at a conference in Ohio and the, the man of God who was praying over us in front of everyone was saying, you are approved of God. And he actually had done something that no one had ever done for us ever. And he kind of he took like, this impromptu offering for us and said, everyone, come up here. And as people are bringing money up, he goes, this money right now is speaking of approval for you. Is that people don't give to what they don't approve of. Money speaks of approval. And then when this, these people had promised three weeks ago that they were going to give, <clears throat> the Lord once again reminded me, you have my approval. And I, I turned to Sandy and I said, I don't even think it's the amount that matters right now. It's, it's not a matter of what is going on. It's that the Lord is saying, I approve you. If I can turn the hearts, and these are people that Sandy and I have been praying for forever. <coughs> Daily almost. I mean, it's been praying and praying, and God has been touching the hearts. And the Lord, there were several things he was saying was, don't you think that I can do whatever I will? And in the process, you are approved. And it wasn't us specifically. I mean, we believe that God is, was telling us that we're approved. But specifically, I believe the Lord was saying, I-61 is approved. I'm proud of you. I approve you. And it shook our week this week as we read this, because when you see things in pieces, you get excited because you're like, you hear the word reverse, and you're like, cool, reverse. Okay, God, you're going to reverse. What's going on? And then all of a sudden, you get the word of God that takes basically all that he's been saying for the last several months and puts it in one word where you're reading the whole thing. And that's why I was so overwhelmed. I'm like, oh my gosh, God, this is everything we've been saying. Like, is this woman in her house somewhere hiding? And we just sat there with the whole day as we talked back and forth. In the next several days, we talked back and forth. It just seemed like one thing led to another. Like, we would say, well, this is what God is showing her. She then sends me the text for tonight in Joshua chapter 3. And as I read it, I'm like, okay. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. What about this? And then she went just back and forth. And this revelation kept pouring. It was incredible. And I believe that the word of God tonight, it's, at its very bare bones, is that God is in the process of reversal. The very things in your life that are been holding you back, illnesses, financial stuff, God is in the process of shifting your thinking and turning the way you think to his perspective, and in that process, things will be reversed. So, Sandy, you have the other side of the I think it's so important from this word that if you feel like this word could be for you, I, I know not every word is for everybody. Um, we definitely feel like this word is for us, it's for I see two ministries. Um, but if you feel like this word is for you, I really, I really want you to pray into that because the whole going from processing to approved, it's kind of like shocking. Almost, I think it would be. I don't, we're not seeing the manifestation of that yet. But if we don't get out of our old thinking, it will pass us by. So we have to get on board with the, it is now. When we were praying up here for the worship team before our service, like loud and clear, it's a new day. It's like, God, it's a new day. It's not yesterday anymore. It's a new day today. So you've got to be, as it's a new day, no longer do I have the aches and pains and poorness of yesterday, I have a new day. What is God doing today? What is God doing right now? And be on the lookout for that. It's really cool that Australia is praying for America. It's 
amazing, really, because there are times that I think of other countries in the world, and like China. Like China is something that I think about with the underground church and or you know the persecuted church, like I pray for the persecuted church. But I don't know if I've ever thought of a nation, you know, like Australia, and I'm like, I'm gonna pray for Australia today. Like that just doesn't <clears throat> cross our minds very much. And for such a movement to have begun around the world to pray for America, it just, that gets me all choked up inside. Like, you guys love us that much? Like, wow. But then when I, when I read, you know, what went into this whole thing, um, I was like, wow, like, they remember. Um, this is from the Elijah List from Warwick Marsh. Um, and it's the, the National Day of Prayer and Fasting Team from Australia, together with other national leaders, has called the nations of the world to pray and fast for the USA for seven days, from April 30th to May 6th. Um, Australia believes it's our turn to bless the nation of America and pray for healing for the USA through prayer and fasting, according to 2 Corinthians 7, 14. Chronicle, sorry. We are grateful for the protection of America being Australia and the nations of the free world during World War II. The Battle of the Coral Sea fought by USA in 1942 was a turning point in the Second World War for Australia. Thank God for America. Everybody agrees that our respective nations are in crisis and somebody should do something. That something is found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Only a concerted and united campaign of prayer, fasting, and repentance can restore the church and then the nation to spiritual health. We need revival and reformation. America is in crisis because it has forgotten the rock from which it has been hewn, and it is falling into moral and spiritual bankruptcy. Moral and spiritual bankruptcy leads to financial and governmental bankruptcy. America is in great danger from within and without. Prophetic writer and minister Laura Vosser from Australia said there is a fight for the destiny of the USA right now. The destiny of America hangs in the balance. The Lord is calling his people to arise and pray for the United States of America. It's time to contend. We are calling the nations of the world to join the prayer and fasting with their brothers and sisters in Christ for revival and reformation in the USA. <clears throat> the prayer that he has on here is, Father in heaven, thank you for America, home of the brave and land of the free. This nation has been a great blessing to the nations of our world. She has financed the preaching of the gospel to the four corners of the earth, sent missionaries to almost all the nations of the world. We thank you for the enormous aid given to the poor around the globe. We thank you for the protection that the American Armed Forces have given freely to the peoples of the earth. Today we stand in the gap on behalf of the nation of America and cry out for mercy. We thank you that mercy triumphs over judgment. We thank you that you want to bless us and heal us. Jesus has made a way at the cross and his blood cries out grace and more grace. Lord, forgive us. Lord, cleanse us. Lord, heal us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I think it's so awesome that they point out the good things about America. You know, it's it's so often, you know, I mean, we should repent for America, but we, we've really come, we've fallen far. We've really fallen far away in the abortions and all, all that. We're, we're, doing, we're not doing great, and it's part of a lot. People, lots, lots of other countries don't like America. Like or snobs or this or that or the other thing. But I thought it was so wonderful that they brought up the good that we do. We do do good things. America does do good things. You know, saying is a great accuser. It's always called this finger. Like, look what they did now. Look what they did. But there are good things. And we are so thankful for Australia and the other nations that are praying for us right now. Um, we do need Second Chronicles 714. We do need to humble ourselves and repent and seek God. And God will do it again. He will. There are, I believe there are enough Christians 
who are willing to add our faces before God in our stadium for this country and God will save this country. We would love to see the revival. The one thing I, I see in there that I know what he meant, but I think to expound on is the world does look, and, and they say that the American Armed Forces have given freely, but really it's got a great cost. I mean, the Second World War cost literally hundreds of thousands of American lives. But yet we are willing to pay a price. And I think people are looking now and saying, you know what, if they hadn't stood in the way, um, we wouldn't be where we're at. Australia would be speaking German. Or what means right now. Or both. So tonight, we want to go from these words and what God is currently saying around the world to kind of narrowing in what God is saying now for ISIS to come. What does this mean? Because we can sit here and say, oh, that's wonderful, that's great, oh my goodness, but what does that mean for us? And in a second, Sandy, you're going to read, you're going to have someone read the, the scripture for tonight out of Joshua 3. And we've been wrestling with this, and I'm sure there's even a greater revelation. We've been wrestling with it all we do. But I want to start out tonight by saying the presence of God is to be paramount to our direction and victory. Meaning it is the top goal. It must lead us, and by must, I mean it must lead us, and always be at the front of what we do and who we are. When we fail to keep this, we will not be led properly or have victory. It is the presence of God that leads us and directs us and guides us and takes us to where we're supposed to be. I think far too often we get comfortable in our lives either by following a man or by following what, where God was. And the problem with that is you never wind up where he is. It is his presence that must be the distinction. And as far as I-61, it is this presence that we are seeking because that is what will distinguish us. It is the distinction between the people of God and the people that proclaim to be from God or people who don't care at all. We are meant to be set apart and look different. When people see the fire, the pillar of fire leading us through, we should look different. They should say, why is that leading them? What is that that's leading them? What is going on? And so tonight, we are talking about crossing over. We are talking about the people of God. God is calling I-61 to cross over. And so through this tonight, Sandy and I are going to kind of go back and forth a little bit and hope to hear the heart of God through us tonight. So normally, I'm with Journey in the room. But tonight they're in here. And this week, well, we've been, the past few weeks we've been going through the book of Joshua. And we are on Joshua 3 this week. And it just so happens that we're teaching on Joshua 3 here. So, Journey, you're going to be involved tonight. Star, would you come up here, please, and read Joshua chapter 3 for us? Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shadow and came to the Jordan, as they stopped there before they crossed. They crossed. And it came about at the end of three days that the officer rode through the midst of King. He commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God will the Levitical priest carry it. Then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed. This way. Then Joshua said to the people, Concentrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonder to them. And Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take the ark of the covenant 
and the cross overhead of the people, so they took it up, the ark and the covenant, and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that Jesus, that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall more and come with the priests who are carrying the ark of the covenant, so when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the men of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that you are living God and that he will as surely disposes from before you have the king in the city. So there's a real couple of really awesome things in here. So first, we're going to cover the unknown. Okay, in verse four, Joshua says um, he's telling the priests to go take the Ark of the Covenant, and he says, "Take it two thousand cubits in front." Why? Because they had not gone that way before. There are, there are seasons in our lives right now. There are things that God is doing where we're in a new day. So new means you've never been there. So if you've never been there, that means that you need directions. Or else you're going to get lost. So you've got this mass of people waiting to cross this river, and God says, I want you to shift what was done before. The way it was before was the ark was in the middle. The tabernacle of the Lord was always in the center of all of Israel as they wandered the wilderness. He says, now I want my ark in front. What changed? What changed was that in the very beginning, when they crossed the Red Sea, it was a man holding the staff that parted the seas. And it was a man that listened to the voice of the people and got them lost for 40 years. And God was saying, no more. It's my time. You are my people. It will be my presence that takes you. And so he commands the ark to go in front 
Because he says, you've never been that way before. You don't know where you're going. I will direct you. I will direct you. You must have total reliance on God. Because you've never been here. And you don't know where to go. This is where total submission to God, His presence, and, His presence and purposes are a must. We're in a place where there's no more game, no, or no more room for the games of partial submission to God. I like the feeling of this, but I'd like to go there, but I don't know. God was shifting the entire way that they had done existence since they left Egypt. An entire generation had to die off because they refused to listen to God. Now you got one man, Joshua, who's left to lead, and he's saying, look, this is what God is saying to do. And these people are probably all like, wait a minute, we've always done it this way. This is how it's always been. Now I'll tell you, Joshua did a really smart thing. I'm not going to trample on Sandy's thing here, but... Joshua did a really smart thing. He asked for 12. He asked for a representative from each of the tribes. When you're trying to command a group of people and you want to just stand on a soapbox and just start shouting, you're often misunderstood. His way of getting to the people was, I want each tribe represented so I can speak to them. And I'll let Sandy speak to that later in more detail, but Joshua was smart. And then he sent the officers through the camp, and he gave orders to keep the order and to keep people safe. As the presence of God was feared not to be touched. Why would they need to be afraid? Why would the people of God need to be afraid? Because if they tried to get ahead of the ark and accidentally touch it, dead. We're coming to a time where when we see and we're seeking the presence of God, there's a double-edged sword. It's awesome because God leads us and God leads us to victory and it's amazing. But the flip side of it is if you dare touch it and get in the way of it, you're dead, you're gone, you're done. You don't mess with the presence of God. And the people of God knew this. Joshua knew this well enough to say, listen, we got to get this out front because we need direction. But we also need this out front because as it's leading us, it's so powerful. I don't want anyone messing with this. When we don't know where we are, it's best to follow directions from those in authority and those who have spiritual wisdom because it's a covering and it's got protection for us. I will put it this way. If Joshua had screwed up, I think God would have smoked Joshua and given the people grace. You can always count on the fact that if you're following under submission to what God's asking you to do and someone else makes a mistake who's over you and asking you to do something, God will deal with that. There is grace. However, if you're not doing that, that's where God deals with you directly. And I believe what God is doing is he's removing the figureheads, if you will. In our time now, in our world today, he's removing the idol. Not that pastor's wrong, pastor's lead, and that's good, but when they become an idol and, and they become something that replaces God in their life, God's removing that and saying something that's even more terrifying. I want to lead. I want to take the wheel. Which means we don't get control anymore. We don't get control of the direction or destiny. We're not headed at the steering wheel. We're in the back seat. We're actually in the trunk. God's like, dude, I'm going. He's not looking for a backseat driver. He's not looking for someone to like try and give hints about, oh, slow down, there's a turn coming up. Oh, hey, what about? God's like, I got this. It's up to you to sit down, shut your mouth, and enjoy the ride. But you gotta go with me on this. And so I believe that we're coming into a time of the unknown. And let me tell you something. The ride can be a little bumpy. When none of us have ever been there before, it's going to be challenging because we're going to be walking 
we don't know that there's rocks ahead. I mean, it's dark out, and we're just like, oh, oh hey guys, there's a rock over here. Be careful, you know. You you just gotta take it step by step by step, and trust that God is leading and that God is taking you where you're going, and work it through. That's where I feel like unity is the need the greatest. Because that's where the easiest, in this time of being unknown, this is where people's fear of lack of control comes the greatest. Because all of a sudden God starts moving, and it's not just the leadership of the church, it's in our own lives as we move together that all of a sudden it's like, ah, i got to have control of something. And then all of a sudden God's like, no, no you don't, just go. And it becomes a challenge to us to let go of God. The unknown can be scary, but I want to not go on the dark side of it tonight. I don't want to tell you the unknown is exciting. Because all I know is that with these words and what God is showing us, the unknown means everything we've been praying for and believing for, God is about to move. Amen. Whatever the cost, amen. So, after realizing that you're going into the unknown, you have to know what your boundaries are. The Israelites kept a safe distance from the ark for a few reasons. Now, I want to ask a question. This is not a rhetorical question. I want answers, including my journey kids. Who knows what the ark of the covenant was? Oh, no. Not know the ark. The ark of the covenant. It might be similar. It was that ark that you were looking for. Stephen? <laughs> I just said that. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> it was Aaron's staff. Same thing though. Same Moses. Yeah. Star. Here the presence of God. That is correct. What else was in the ark other than Aaron's staff? There are two other things in the ark. Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Ten Commandments, one other thing. I didn't realize this. Nope. No bones. A jar of manna. I said that. So the ark was a, a big um, gold rectangular, you almost would think of it like a I, whenever I think about it, I think of like a coffin. I don't know why I think of like a coffin, but that's what I think of. But it was a, a rectangular box, and it held Aaron's staff, the Ten Commandments, and the jar of manna. And that was the presence of God. All of those three things that were in that were supernatural things from the Lord. So this ark was the presence of God. Um, so why did it have to keep such a distance? Why did the ark have to be a half mile ahead of these people? Well, as Pastor Joel mentioned earlier, to keep people from touching it. Um, if you touch it, you die. The only people who could carry that thing were the Levitical priests, and there was a certain way of carrying it too. Um, in fact, one time it was about to fall off of the things they were carrying it on, and the priest went to go grab it to pull the setting and he died. <laughs> so, um, the ark had to be ahead of them to allow God to lead. God can't lead you if he's right here. God can't lead you if he's back here. He has to be in front so he can lead you. And it was to not allow anyone to jump ahead of where God was directed. We're going to go over how many people were with Joshua when he crossed the door in a few minutes. Um, there were a lot. A whole lot. And if they were too close, they could overtake the ark, and the ark would totally get lost in the middle of this big mass of people, and then the ark's not leading anymore. The presence of God's not leading anymore. So, first you're going into the unknown. Then you have to know what your boundaries are. Third, you have to consecrate yourselves. Joshua said, <laughs> Then Joshua said to the people in verse 5, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to get ready for what God is going to do in our lives. This is done to approach God with a pure heart. It involves repentance and intent. 
Um, consecration, back in the Old Testament, there was a purification ceremony. The Israelites, they would sacrifice something on an altar to God, and that would cleanse them of their sins, and um, it would make them um, pure again. It would make them holy and set apart to the Lord. In the New Testament, it means something different. Um, same but different. In the New Testament, the word for consecrate is sanctified. Sanctification. And a lot of people get confused about what sanctification is. They'll say sanctification is cleansing yourself, is purifying yourself. Well, not really. Um, <coughs> consecration or sanctification involves surrender. It's a total, absolute surrender. Um, you turn to Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of service, of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have, to, we have to renew our minds, we have to transform ourselves, we have to lay ourselves on the altar, not an animal, we lay ourselves on the altar and say, here you God, you have, you are God, you have all of me. Um, consecration involves a transference of ownership. In 1 Corinthians 6.20 it says, we're not our own, we're bought with a price. So we know that it's not our bodies anymore, it's not our lives anymore, it's the Lord's. It's saying, God, everything I have is yours. It's living a Christ-centered life. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, people, especially if you haven't known the Lord very long, you don't know what this all sanctification and consecration and, you know, all this stuff means, or lay my life on the altar for God. Like, what is that? So how can we do that today? How can we live a Christ-centered life? How can we live a sanctified life today? Well, first of all, you hold yourself to a higher standard. You hold yourself to the law, God's command, what God told us to do. Just because Jesus came and died on the cross doesn't mean that we don't have to obey the Ten Commandments anymore. We still have a law to follow. Um, that will set us apart. Um, you know, we, we pray, we seek the Lord. We, we don't make big moves until we've heard from God. You know, it's, it's not very often that you, you hear people say, oh, I heard from God. So I'm going to go pursue this job or this career. Or I heard from God, so I'm going to marry this person. Or I heard from God, so I'm going to um, take this vacation or whatever it is. You know, we always were always well, I think I should do this. I think I heard God say this. We need to get a little more confident. We need to get on our faces and seek God, hear from Him, and then move. I have so many like little notes in <laughs> And then, okay, so sanctification means to set apart for holy use. We must cleanse ourselves first. So before we can be sanctified, we do have to cleanse ourselves. That means repentance. That means turning from our sins. Um, so to cleanse is to separate ourselves from sin. To sanctify is to separate ourselves up to God. That's the difference. Cleansing and sanctification are not the same thing, but they complement each other. So, after that, we want to talk about the fruit of the character of Joshua. He didn't get to this place. The Israelites did not get to this place just because. There was a lot involved in their character for God to be able to work with them. So I want to ask, after reading the scripture and hearing about Joshua and what he did, what do you think are some characteristics of Joshua? You know, smart. He was smart? Absolutely. What else? Yes. He didn't see no giant and giant. Yes, no, you're not. Joshua was all of what he said. And he was obedient. Joshua's obedience set him up for honor 
and promotion. And we can learn a lot from that. Um, obedience is better than sacrifice. We read that in the Bible. Um, we can make all the sacrifices in the world and, oh, I did all this for you, God, but can we bring you Or um, steal, or lie, or just have a darn bad attitude, you know, because you're complaining about all these things you just did for um, he heard God speak and he acted on it. He didn't just sit there and wait for God to do something. God said, you're going to take possession of this land. So what did Joshua do? He got up early in the morning. He had to rise early in the morning to prepare things, to talk to his officers so that they knew to go and spread the word through all the camps and to all the 12 tribes get ready. This is what's going to happen. And he was smart. He was wise. He had strategy. He was a brilliant warrior. He was brilliant on the battlefield. Joshua's bravery and obedience not only allowed him to hear from God, but it made a way for God to use him to do great and mighty things and lead a generation into the promised land. So, guesses. How many people do you think Joshua led across that Jordan? How many people did Joshua lead into the promised land? I guess. No. Stephen? A thousand? Five thousand? Oh, a million? Twelve thousand? Who else? There is not a trick. This is not a trick question. I have an answer for you. Sorry. Eighty thousand? Two million. It's an estimated two million people. That he led into that land. So when it says that Joshua got up, he rose early in the mornings in the first verse. He rose early in the morning to get everyone and lead them from Shittim to the to the banks of the Jordan. That was no easy feat. That would, I can't imagine moving two million people. I can't imagine how much how long it takes. Like everyone had to get like their families ready and change diapers and make sure everyone's fed and grab the snacks and. Pack up the tents. Like, that takes a long time. <sighs> That's a lot. Um, <sighs> so, Sandy and I were talking in the car, and the, the cool revelation was Joshua was so smart that. So he's leading two million people, approximately. Uh, approximately, the, the numbers actually gives us a number of men. There were six hundred and something thousand men. You double that for the women, and then you add children to that, and then they didn't even include the Levites, and there were extra for the Levites. So Joshua understood, I can't adequately promote the word of God to every single person. So what does he do? He asks for representatives from every tribe. And those representatives are responsible to tell the clan leader. And that clan leader was responsible to tell the family head. And the family head was responsible to, to, to uh, whatever you want to call it, to give the word, distribute the word to the whole family. When you read through the Old Testament, there was actually a system that was set up so when there were problems arising, someone argued there was a there was, there was a, a problem in a family, or the, the family had a problem with where they were going. There was a system set up, because there's no way Joshua could have listened to two million people. Probably would have wanted to jump off a cliff. So what he said was, look, I give you a representative. You got a beef, you can talk to them. They can bring it to me. If I want to say what the Lord is saying, I'm going to give it to them. I'm not going to give it to all of you. I'm going to give it to them. So when it says Joshua rose up and he told all of the people, what he's saying is, he told the 12 and his military people, this is what we're doing. They went in turn and told all the rest of the people. They didn't have microphones and you know sweet sound systems and stuff back in those days. You could imagine, yeah, trying to yell for 2 million people would have been tough. But you think about how he was able to compartmentalize the whole thing. It was so cool because it led to unity. Because then each family understood they had a voice. They would have been heard. And Joshua was willing to listen, but Joshua also had to not only deal with the people, but he had enemies to look forward to. So he had a lot on his plate. 
So, and I want, we want you to keep in mind that as we're talking about this, we do feel like this is the work of the Lord for all of us. So what should you be taking from this? You're taking from this, well, how do I deal with the unknown? How do I um, have boundaries with the Lord and, you know, not step on his toes? Um, what should I do with myself? I consecrate myself, right? I, I cleanse myself. I purify myself. I set myself apart to the Lord. I look at my character. What do I need to work on? Okay? I don't know what stage of this you are all at, but Joshua had to go through a time before he was a leader. Before he was a leader, he was a faithful servant. It was his time of training as a loyal and faithful servant of Moses that allowed him to lead the people. He was a military strategist and led the army for Moses. He never once tried to lead a coup. He was a servant for a very long time. He was a servant for years and years and years before God placed him in leadership. Four years, right? He was a faithful follower and servant, and that enabled him to be a competent leader. We can't expect to jump in something and start leading something right away. You have to be a servant first. You have to humble yourself, submit yourself under authority, and prove yourself. You know, when we were younger, in our early 20s, we always wondered, what is it going to be our turn, God? What are we going to have our ministry? What are we going to be able to do this? You know, we want to do mighty things for you, Lord. We don't want to sit on the sidelines. We want to be right in there in the midst of battle. And God, you know, he took his time. We were, you know, had to submit under other leadership. But you know what? We enjoyed it. We really enjoyed the ride. We loved our time in youth ministry. Uh, we enjoyed being associate pastors. We enjoyed, we even enjoyed our, we did nursing home ministry. I love people, love people. We served. We just served. But you know, we were making such an impact. So never despise small beginnings. Never <coughs> look down on, oh, I'm going to be here forever. Always a bridesmaid, never the bride, right? Don't despise those things. God is preparing you. He's training you. He's raising you up and he's waiting to see you have all these characteristics and being ready to take on the challenge that he has for you because he does have really big plans for you. If you'll submit to him. If you will submit under the authority that he's placed you under. And if you're somewhere that God has not placed you and you're finding it hard to submit to that authority, get out and go somewhere else where God has placed you so that you can faithfully, with a good conscience, submit under that authority. Joshua was one of only two people who came back with a positive report from the first trip to the Promised Land. And he knew stuff. He knew what God had said. The naysayers died in the wilderness. So are we coming with a good report, or are we a naysayer? Are we coming in, oh, they're huge giants. They tower over us. They'll kill us. There's no way. It's, it's really hard to go somewhere that's intimidating, that looks intimidating, even if God told you to go there. It's like, are you sure, God? Did you really? Did you really tell me to go there? It can't be. Look at me. I can't do that. And God's saying, don't question me. Trust me. Joshua had so much trust in God. And back in the very first chapter of uh, Joshua, he tells him three times within a few verses, be strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous. He told Joshua that he was going to be with him wherever he goes, and God is telling us the very same thing. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. I will be with you wherever you go. Be very strong and courageous. Trust me. Trust what I've told you. Trust that it's going to come to pass. I've given you a promise. Don't let it go. Don't fall by the wayside. Just because you're in that processing phase, don't think that it's not going to come. Because guess what? Approval is coming. And it's going to come when you least expect it. It's going to like be there. It's just all of a sudden going to... The, the approval button shows up and you're like, 
Approved now? Now it's proved? It's going to take you by surprise. But then walk into it. Go with it. Have your shot for like five seconds and then be over with and be like, man, it's here, we're going. And I just think it's really cool because, you know, she was talking about Joshua 1. And the reason the Lord was telling me strong and courageous, he had served Moses for 40 years. And he loved Moses. He loved him. And he served him and he protected him and, and, and all of that. And all of a sudden Moses dies. And now the Lord's like, you're up. But is that a no, it wasn't the patronizing pack. No, no, no. The patronizing pack you're kind of up. aggregates. But this was just like a little tap on the shoulder. That's how you do that for a husband. Okay, you go do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Moses... Moses dies, and so now Joshua is being tapped on the shoulder, and the Lord's like, hey, bud, it's your turn now. And Joshua was so hesitant because he loved Moses, and I'm sure he was thinking, how can I fill those shoes? And so God's like, I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to be strong and bold and courageous. I'm asking you to be who I've called you to be, who you've been trained to be. And I've given you influence, and I've given you ability. And so I feel like sometimes we think that, like, if I get too close to people, and I love people too much, I'll never be able to, like, separate myself and actually lead something, because I'll just be too dumbed out. On the contrary, when you love someone that deeply, you're willing to let them invest so deeply into you, and that's what... Joshua loved Moses to be. Joshua would not have been the man he was without Moses. They both only knew Egypt. Joshua was, I think, the only one left from Egypt to cross the promised land. Not and Caleb, I'm not sure if Caleb was around. He might have been, but if so, that's only two. Everyone else who left died. He's the only one with the memories of the slavery and getting beaten and whipped. It had burned into his conscience. And now he feels inadequate to lead the people into the promised land, but God gives him a pep talk and says, listen, you're okay, you're going to do this, this is good, you're, you're, you're ready. And so then Joshua in this chapter starts, okay, I got a plan, I got a strategy, let's do this. This is how we're going to move. This is how we're going to do this. We're going to do this orderly. This is going to be done in order so that it's not chaotic. If two million people at once decide they're going to cross the river, we're going to get ahead of the ark. Imagine if they decide to do a right turn, and you got the whole right side kind of going this way. The ark is going to get moved. And no longer God will be leading, but the people will be leading. And so Joshua understood all of this. This is a lot of people. Imagine going from being just the advisor to the man, to all of a sudden being the man. And you're not leading a family of like two or five people. You're leading two million people. And you're not just a figurehead, you're actually living with them. It's not like you can run away to the White House behind security. You're living with them. So you make a wrong decision, you didn't give the right family the right amount of manna, you're going to hear about it. And not hear about it through some phone call. They're going to come knocking at your tent door and they're going to say, hey, give me your manna. We didn't get to eat enough. Right? Like he was fully accessible. So Joshua knew God at that level. So we talked about, the, the next thing we want to talk about is how our great and mighty God. So when Israel crossed over the Red Sea from Egypt, it was Moses who led them. But now it was Joshua. And God himself wanted to prove that he was great and mighty. That is what God is doing right now. It's not to say that God is not going to have people placed in positions that are going to lead, because that needs to happen. I mean, we're like sheep. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we would, even with God right in the middle of us, we'd run right if he's telling us to go straight. It's our natural tendency. But God was saying, apart from that, I have Joshua leading you. And Joshua is the man I've anointed, but I want to direct you. I want you to follow the path this way. This is where we're going. So, this is why, you know, this is 
a new thing God is doing in the church. And this is why we've been in such a hard time. Because God's been trying to teach us how to rely on Him and His presence alone will save us. You know, we've been talking, my wife and I, you know, financially are not in the greatest position. I mean, not even by long shot. And God has asked us, to, asked us to do things that make no sense to the natural mind. Literally. And we're like, okay, God, but what if we just do this? And God's like, no, sit down. And guess what we do? We actually try it. And a couple times God has allowed us to do it. And what ends up happening is we end up frustrated, bitter, not towards people, but like almost like, oh, I just don't want to do this anymore. This is not right. You just get that, you just know. And there are a couple times where we end up trying to do what God stripped of us. So, for example, Sandy had her business taken away from her last year. And we thought it was, well, you know, God allowed it, but we thought it was the devil. And then it was earlier this year, the person called back up and said, the, the person who she was doing business with was like, hey, I got another position for you. And the first instinct must, was, oh my gosh, let's do it. And I was like, eh, I don't know, but I needed her to hear from God. And when she heard from God, she was like, no, because what God had told her was, why would you take back what I stripped from you? You want to talk about a moment of like, whoa. Okay, wait a minute. So that means if you stripped it, that means the first thing that happened wasn't the devil, it was you. Oh. Maybe we give the devil too much credit to begin with, and that's why we had so much hell trying to find peace. Gave the credit to the wrong person. And then you might think, well, God, why would you strip that from me? That's not fair. We struggled financially because of that. And you know what God would say? Because it's my turn to leave you, not yours. Give me the keys and get out of the driver's seat right now. And the quicker you are to do that, the quicker you get to where you're supposed to be. God wanted to prove how mighty and great. And there, why do you think, though, let me ask a question. If you would just, why do you think God wanted to prove this? Why do you think God was in the process of wanting to prove how great and mighty? For us, what? Okay, new mindset. Anyone else? This is, and this is exactly what I thought until I read the verse again. He did it on purpose to scare the garbage out of the enemy. It wasn't about that. He was preparing and laying the tracks for an easy victory in the promised land. Because of the works that God was doing, despite how uncomfortable Israel was when God did them, spies from all the lands around were watching. This new group of two million people wander around the wilderness and eventually wind up on the banks of the Jordan. They knew that they were there. They had been watching. And they saw this group of people who had a pillar of fire over them in a cloud. And they were like, don't want to mess with those people. And then all of a sudden, they knew that they had crossed the Red Sea. The Egyptian army had been drowned. They didn't do anything to deserve it. Oh, some, some god must be, oh, that must, oh, that's terrifying. All of a sudden now, God was going to get his victory. The chapter before this, um, if you read in uh, second or Joshua chapter 2, last verse, verse 24, the spies had gone in, um, they stayed at Rahab's house, the top of Rahab, and Rahab told them, everybody's melting in fear here. We're all melting in fear because we've heard the reports, we've heard what has happened. So the spies come back and they say, surely the Lord has given all the land to our hands, and all the inhabitants of the land, moreover, they have melted in fear before us. They were melting in fear. God had already done so much in them. The word had spread all over Jericho. So, I wonder what people are saying about us. Look at the great and mighty things that God has already done in our lives so far. 
Are we sharing that? Are we making testimonies out of that? Are we letting people know? Do you know what my God did? Especially to those who don't know the Lord. If we are come by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We need that word to go out. You need that testimony to go out to people so they can hear about our great and mighty God. It's really important. And I can only imagine. I mean, Jericho had walls that were several feet thick. There was no way Israel was going to find a way in. And yet they were terrified. They had nothing to do with that. They were terrified of the God that led them. And they knew that they were not a people to be messed with. You may feel like you've been wandering in the wilderness, but God's been preparing you, having others watching you in the process, in your process of submission to Him, despite walking around the mountain for 40 years. He's in the process of watching others look and get terrified. Because even though you were in sin or rebellion or walking away, He provided food for you, He provided water, He kept you alive, He kept you moving. You had no reason to keep moving, but you did. And they would never have been able to live if they had done the same thing. And then you walk and you're on the banks of the river. And they've heard of all these things that have happened. And they're terrified. It's not us. It's God that they're terrified of. So God wanted to prove how great and mighty he was. And then there was a strategy. Know your enemies. In verse 10, Joshua reads off. A list that Star had an awesome time reading of all these people. How would Joshua have known all these people? How would he have had any idea? Did they all send him postcards? Did he have a personal relationship with every person there? No. Joshua had already been over in the land. He spied it out and he knew of all of the people that were there. Joshua, think about this. It was stored up here for 40 years. And he couldn't do anything about it. And now he's sitting at the banks of the river and he's like, let's get ready because we got this tribe and this tribe and this tribe and this tribe and this tribe. And you can imagine the generals going, how do you know this? I was there before. And I know who's there. But I know where God will take care of me. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. Don't go into this blindly thinking, oh, God will take care of all of it. Because when they crossed over the Jordan, God didn't take care of all of it. They had to do some movement. They had to fight battles. If they had just expected that God was going to come in and flick his finger and everyone was dead and they were just going to take the land, they would have been misguided. They had to know their enemy. They had to know where their enemy was, what the strategies were, what could have come against them. Joshua made sure he, that he had knowledge of the land, who they were up against, and what the mentality of the foes were. Joshua was a strategist. And lastly, God likes to show his power. They crossed the Jordan during the flood stage, which meant it was wider, the river was more swollen. The Jordan River is muddy to begin with. It was much muddier. Couldn't see in the water, which meant it was deeper. It was a no-go zone. I mean, there was no way across it. We could maybe have made some sort of human chain and walked across them, I suppose. That wouldn't work very well. Um, there was no way across the river. And this was during harvest time, which actually on the Judaic calendar, the Hebrew calendar, we are in the season of. This what we're reading right now that happened in the book of Joshua is during the very season we're in right now in the natural sense. Think about the significance. It is crossover. So the current of the Jordan was very fast at this time of year, made it very hard to cross. And so what God does is he says, listen, you've put my, my power, my glory in front of you. Now I want you to take the priests now, man, now, mind you, they were not allowed to touch the ark. They had poles that went through rings that were in the ark that they held. They never touched it. But you could imagine how fearful they must have been handling that thing. They must have all walked in lockstep. 
If it started to jostle, they probably didn't say, oh, wait, come on, get your stuff in the back. No, they probably stopped and said, make sure it's together because I'm not touching this thing. But they went ahead and they, God told them to go in front of all the people in the Jordan and stand in the middle. This was that time where God said, I want my presence in the midst of my people. Because I'm going to move the waters. I'm going to take an impossible situation that no one thinks can happen. It's an enemy. You know, there's no way into the promised land. And I'm going to stop the waters upstream. I'm not only going to stop it here. I want it far upstream because I want the people that live in the cities up there to see my hand move. I want to see the people downstream. They're going to see my hand move. And then I want you to cross over into the promised land. Just when it seems like you're surrounded by the impossible, that's when God shows up by himself to perform the impossible. Your enemies will be forced to watch in terror as you cross the promised land in a way that should not be possible. Everyone melted in fear of Israel. I don't know what would happen if we're downtown and we're getting an ice cream down at the waterfront and I see where the Niagara River and Lake Erie just part. And I knew I had nothing to do with it, and then I see a group of people walk from Canada to the United States. I'm going to be wondering who these people are. I might even be afraid of them. <laughs> so, the thing that I want to challenge us to, though, because it goes on further in, in the close of this, um, the people of God did not fully obey God. God gave them the promised land. And he gave an instruction, but Joshua even himself succumbed to disobedience. And they did not kill off the people that God told them to get rid of. And as a result, Israel started a pattern of destruction, a cyclical pattern, going to God, sinning away, going into captivity, coming back, a constant. Why? Because they didn't obey the exact voice of God. And when God said, kill all of them, I know it sounds kind of harsh. God knew, kill all of them. If you leave a few, they will influence and infiltrate my people, and they will taint and distort my word to my people and destroy my word. The challenge to us today, dare I say, is not getting into the across the Jordan in the promised land. God's promised us that. The challenge is keeping the promised land. The challenge is maintaining what God has promised once we get it. And you can say, no, 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 I've struggled for 20 years to get to this place. Great. Do you want to squander 20 years worth of hell in your life just because you want to do it your way once you got across? Is it worth telling God, thanks for getting here. See ya. I'm doing this. God won't tolerate that. And you're going to find yourself on the outside looking in if you do that. And so I want to challenge you tonight to... Obedience. Complete, total obedience and surrender to God. Tonight, let's get excited because God is doing what He's promised. He's doing it. I told Sandy the other day, I said, could next week could we be looking at a different like could it literally be a physical week? Could we be looking at like a totally different set of circumstances in one week? Yeah. yeah. I think it could be. So, don't be shocked and surprised when it starts happening. It's kind of like when you're like nine months pregnant. I remember like with all my kids, like, you know, being nine months pregnant, being like two weeks overdue, and being like, it could happen now. Or it could happen now. It happened at any point. My wife is pregnant and you're going to labor. You know, you just, it really can happen at any time. But what I really want to encourage you in is. Joshua was obedient to God. Joshua was led by God. But Joshua, like we said, he was smart. So while God said, I'm going to give you possession of this land, Joshua strategized. He prepared. He got all his facts and figures in a row. He had all his ducks in a row. Everything was lined up. He was ready to take it, whatever God told him to. So if God is telling you something, if God has made you a promise, act on it. Don't wait to receive. I mean, you can't wait till you're walking into the promised land to find out who's in there or, you know, what you're up against. You have to find out ahead of time. You have to get your ducks in a row. You, 
right in that word, in that ambassador's words, is that if those who have written, or you, you know, you've not written anymore, start writing again. Write down your strategy, write down your visions, write down your goals, write down your plans. Get everything all together, get everything ready, so that when you get it, you know what to do with it. Don't just sit around and wait for God to drop something in your lap. Pursue it. If God told you he's going to give you something, pursue it. Go after it. Don't go ahead of God, of course. Always keep God in front of you. But go after it. Don't wait. Amen. And that is what we feel. We know. I should say we feel like this. It's not a thing. We know is the word of the Lord for this church. And um, so I want to encourage you tonight. What is it that God has called you to? You know, a couple of weeks ago, a couple, about a month or so ago, the Lord, Sandy and I were talking, the Lord gave us a, a strategy. The Lord was like, you know, if I'm going to give you a building, what should it look like? And I was like, okay. You want to go there? All right, fine. And I stayed up literally three or four hours, and I had graph paper, and I started drawing out the building that I saw. And I felt like the Lord was like, maybe that it wasn't now, but I felt like the Lord was saying, if you don't know what you're seeing, how will you know when you get here? If you want a car, and you're believing for a car, don't you think you should be a little specific? Or would you want a 1974 Pinto? Is that okay? You want to you want to have to push it in order for it to move, or do you want a car that actually moves? Do we need to we need to start? I say that to say we need to strategize. What is it that God has promised? What is it that you believe for right now? And and, and I'm not trying to sound so hokey, but what is it right now? What is it a year from now? What is it five years? Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, what am I going to do? Start writing things out so that way when God starts breaking through for you. Because the Lord was like, if I were to drop money in your lap tomorrow, would you know what to do with it? And I'm like, well, we'd probably get a building. And he's like, yeah, but what kind of building? What would you build? If my answer is, well, I'll think about it when I get there, why? So I'm wasting time now? It's almost like the Lord's like, I've given you a chance to sit out and chill out for a little bit. Not for you to sit out and chill out, but so you can actually get a hold of me and we can kind of discuss this stuff. So that when you get there and it's busy and it's crazy, you'll already have a strategy. Think about when God gives you what you were praying for. You're going to be going, going. Will you have time to sit down and think like, what am I supposed to do? You're going to be caught up and be like, oh my gosh, so overwhelmed. Take the time now to say, Lord, what do I got to do? I got a family and I, you know, I need a better job. Okay, so what do I need to do to get there? Lord, just show me. I'm not, I'm not going to jump ahead of here, but what do you got for me? Is it not a job? Is it, am I supposed to start a business? What is it? Lord, I, I, you know, I, I've got a ministry I want to go towards. Okay, well, what are the steps? Because the Lord might say, your ministry is going to start in five years because there are steps that are going to take you five years to get there. It's not going to happen overnight. It could be something else. But if we don't write out, if we don't become people that write out what God is saying, at the very least, draw it out. If you want a house, Draw it out. Make sure that when you get what God's promised, it's what He's promised. If you need five bedrooms, don't settle for a two bedroom. Right? And don't allow the naysayers that are around you to say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't deserve the five bedroom. You don't need five. Because that's the enemy. He's going to come in and say, oh, just settle for second best. It's okay. It's at least something like what you looked for or what you believe for. And my word would be to him, no. I've waited long enough, I've gone through enough, I've struggled enough for the promise of God in its fullness to come, but I need to know what it looks like. Let's not get fooled by what we thought we were thinking as opposed to what we know we saw and we wrote it down. Let's be people that are that specific. I know you can say, oh, come on, I'm not that type of person. Begin to be. I'm not that person. I took four hours to write out the church and I've shown most of it to you, or most of you in the building. Pretty detailed, maybe more detailed than I normally am. But I felt like the Lord was like impressing me to do it. 
I don't want us to get to the promised land and be like, oh, this is so cool. What are we going to do here? Should we build like a Disneyland or something? I don't know. Like, why not show up in the promised land and be like, oh, there's Jericho. Let's go kill him. Right? Let's go deal with this. We saw it. We knew they were there. We're not surprised that they're there. We know what's there. We know what's coming. We show up in the promised land. All of a sudden, maybe all this money comes in. God blesses this huge way. And we're like, okay, I've got five specific things that we're putting this money towards. I already knew this. I already set this up. That way you don't get fooled into taking a round trip, round the world trip, you know, and all expenses paid, you know. Oh, shoot, I wasted half the money. God, I'm sorry. I believe that this is a serious time. As much as some of the stuff might have been goofy or I'm trying to, you know, make it a little fun, it's serious. God is not going to reveal his glory in the way that it needs to be to those who aren't ready for it. Because it will kill them. His glory is that powerful and is that strong and it should be revered and feared that much. And by fear, it does literally mean fear, be afraid of. As much as we're like, yes, Lord, we want your glory, and we should pursue, we should be excited about it, we should also understand that if we're walking wrongly, and if we're treating it haphazardly, it could do some damage. And so I want us to take that seriousness tonight, because I'm excited where we're going. I just want all of us to get there, and get there in one piece. Some of you, I mean, I, I know most of your stories, you've gone through such a hell. Do you know how much it would break my heart and more so God's heart? Do you imagine if literally you went through 20 years of just garbage and then right at the next, you literally putting your toe on the promised land and you fell? How sad would that be? Don't go ahead of God. And so what we're going to do right now is um, we're going to do communion. And um, before we do, though, before we go into anything, the Word of God says, Jesus himself said, when you're taking communion, examine your heart. And Paul rewrote this. Examine your hearts. Because you shouldn't do this unworthily. You shouldn't do this in a wrong manner with sin, with stuff on you. Because if you do that, you're guilty of judgment from what happened to Jesus, the body and blood of the Lord. And I want to make it a point that when we take communion, I want to make it a point to give us an opportunity to cleanse and go before the Lord and repent. I want us to be able to receive the fullness of what the body and blood of Jesus represent without anything hindering us. We've gone through enough hindrances in our lives that have put one more thing. So tonight, Lord God, we come before you and we, we repent. We not only say, I'm sorry, but we tell you tonight, God, we're going the opposite direction tonight. Lord, we walked in, and this is how we were talking. This is how we were living. This is what we were doing. But Lord, I'm telling you tonight, I'm sorry that I did that. And tonight, Lord God, I'm walking out, and I'm going to do it differently. I promise you, Lord. Lord, we repent of that. And I ask, Lord, tonight that as we take of the body and blood of Jesus tonight, that it would be a supernatural empowering. Lord, I believe there's a significance to this time and this hour. Lord, I don't believe this communion tonight is just any ordinary communion, Lord. I believe you're setting your people up for something. And tonight, Lord God, this, this body and blood of Jesus may represent to us a new beginning. Just as it did when you died on the cross, represented new life and forgiveness of sins. But tonight may it mean us walking into a new place, Lord God. Lord, may the sins that we've carried for so long just drop up. May they be gone. May, Lord, the things that we've been so tempted by, let us not do anymore. The things, Lord God, that have caused us to try and run in front of you, may they not be there anymore. May we determine, Lord, you are first. You are in front. You get to lead. Lord, as scary as that is because I need control of my own life because I've never had control before except for my life. As scary as it is to let go and say, Lord, I give you it all. Lord, tonight may we learn to sit in the back seat with our mouth shut and just trust you've got it. You're taking us in the right direction. May we learn tonight, Lord God, and going forward, how to just let you be in charge. 
May we be satisfied, not just, oh, it's okay. May we be satisfied to fullness as we let you do that. And may we be a people that are truly set apart for your purposes. A people that are truly consecrated for your purposes. Lord, may the giants in the land that stand in front of us not stand a chance because we know whose we are. Lord, we declare tonight a new season, a new day. Lord, do what you will in our lives. Strip us of the old. Strip us of the Egyptian thinking and the, the stuff the, the stuff from the past, the stuff that's holding us down. Strip us of all the old. And allow us, Lord God, to see things in a new perspective. In the name of Jesus. And so as long as you're a believer tonight, you are free to come up and grab some communion. Please feel free to do so. Turn it all around Just wait and see He's gonna make everything beautiful Just in time He's gonna turn it all around Just wait and see He's gonna make everything beautiful Just in time
Lord, may we begin to walk in and recognize the very things that you call us to and promised us. May we not receive them as those that don't just that shouldn't receive, but may we receive them with a heart of gratitude. And tonight, Lord God, our hearts are full and we say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We remember you tonight.
that Abraham would be said, if only one pray, if there's only one righteous in the land, the Lord says it's not impossible. We are in the end times, but it is not impossible for him to hold back evil while salt is on this earth, if we will humble ourselves and pray. And God said, then you will have, and then what Pastor Joel said was that the glory would begin to see and people would see the difference between the light and the 